Good afternoon, all. And you're very welcome to uh, this meeting with Lord Adonis, uh, who is, can I think fairly be described as a, a fervent European. Um, the title is Why Brexit Can Still Be Stopped. I would suspect that almost everybody in the room is hopeful that it can be stopped. Uh, and we'd be very interested to hear you tell us uh, why that may be so. Uh, before I invite you to speak, may I just remind you, please, to <coughs> make sure your telephones are turned off uh, and to say that the event, uh, the whole event, is on the record. Not only the initial uh, speech, the initial talk, but the question and answer it afterwards. Lord Adonis, thank you for coming. Thank you. Should I speak for a minute? Yeah, sorry. Can I just say it's, uh, it's absolutely great to be, um, uh, to be in Dublin and, and to be with you. Um, can I let you into a secret? The passion of my life is, in fact, trains. It's not fighting Brexit or doing any of this international relations stuff. Indeed, until this Brexit thing got going, I'd never made a speech in Parliament about foreign affairs. I'd just taken it as for granted. I regard it as a very boring subject. We were in Europe, you know, we no longer had any of these imperial pretensions and all that, so foreign policy was largely on autopilot, and we had extremely distinguished ambassadors and, uh, uh, and experts who dealt with it. It's only because of the existential crisis of Britain's relations with the rest of the world, actually, but not least with uh, the European Union and, uh, first and foremost, with uh, the Republic of, of Ireland, that I've got involved in this at all. My great passion is, 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 uh, is, um, is infrastructure and education, and that's brought me to Dublin and to Ireland uh, several times. Uh, and indeed, when you've so kindly extended your invitation to me, the decisive factor in deciding to accept it sooner at the earliest possible date was I've been wanting to go on your trams. And uh, I've, I've tweeted out, those of you who follow me on Twitter, I've already done several tweets on the trams, on the green line, where it goes, the alignment, the, where you've ordered the trams from. And I've done a video going, going past the general post office and all that. So my mission is finished. I mean, I've done what I came here to do. But I'm told that in order to earn my keep, I needed to give you some remarks about uh, Brexit as well. Uh, so uh, I just want, let me, should I speak for 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll get a discussion going? Because I, I don't want to tell you just things you've read in the paper, because you know what the situation is. We're about to have our third Prime Minister in three years. Theresa May's deal was rejected three times. The European Union has made clear there isn't going to be any substantive renegotiation. There might be a bit of waffle, but there's already a load of waffle which is already there. There's you who follow the detail of it in the letters that were exchanged between Juncker, Tusk and Theresa May about accelerating trade talks and all that, but the backstop will be there, all of the withdrawal agreement will be there. There wasn't a majority for it in the House of Commons before. I don't think there'll be a majority in the House of Commons for it again. I can't see where the votes come from. You know, LBJ famously said that the first rule of politics is the ability to count. Any, any, any deal that is based on Theresa May's deal guarantees that the DUP will vote against it, and at least half of what's called the ERG, which is the Jacob rees mogg group, which they call the European... Uh, reform research group, but which I call the economic ruin group. So you can tell where we come from on this, on this issue. So there isn't a majority for that. And by a process of elimination, because remember Sherlock Holmes is our great gift to international detection, famously said at the end of a study in Scarlet, uh, Watson, once you've eliminated the impossible, you are just left with the improbable, which must be the truth. So if Theresa May's deal is eliminated, no deal is eliminated, and despite what Boris says, there's, there was a majority of 200 against no deal last time Parliament voted on it. Yesterday, Parliament voted, the House of Commons voted by a majority of 42 to require Parliament to meet in September and October, so there will be a repeat of that if, uh, if, if there's any attempt at no deal in in October, so that's not an option. Um, uh, there isn't going to be a further negotiation of any substance because um, there's no, uh, that's been made clear by the EU, it won't happen. In any case, the only negotiation there could be would be a one which are with a higher level of integration because the only credible proposal on the table which would work for the partners is, uh, is something like Norway or Switzerland. There's no way a Conservative government could negotiate that. Otherwise, you're left with the withdrawal agreement and then trying to negotiate a free trade agreement at some point thereafter. So once you've eliminated all those options, uh, the impossible ones, you are just left with the improbable. And there are two improbable options, and that's all that's left. Actually, there are three. One is called Boris Johnson himself, which is deeply improbable, but that one is, has now happened by a process of elimination because the, anyone else who had any potential to lead the Conservative Party uh, and could get the support of their members, who are, who are uh, a peculiar lot at the moment, 
that, uh, 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 that, that has uh, resulted in Boris Johnson. But the other two um, uh, in, uh, improbable options are a referendum or a general election. Uh, my view is, which has made my view now for 18 months, is that we will end up with a referendum because once you've eliminated the impossible, we're left with the improbable, and that would be a referendum, and we'll end up remaining. It's, and everything that's happened in the whole time I've been seriously engaged in this has, has tended in that direction, and nothing has, you know, we're now on the third extension. There's no deal that's proved to be possible. There's no viable majority for any uh, alternative uh, uh, arrangement. So all of that um, uh, remains uh, true. It is possible there could be an election, and the reason there could be elections is not because it, rationally it would make any sense to have an election, because both of our major parties are split, and um, uh, the... Uh, uh, and the electoral alignment, particularly with Nigel Farage, resurgent on the right with his Brexit party, which of course is taking massive votes from the Conservatives, but also the Liberal Democrats who are rising from the centre again, who will take votes from the, for, in, on the centre, which is particularly in, in, in provincial England, where the Conservatives have a lot of members of Parliament. So it wouldn't be rational in terms of being cool and calculating to hold an election, but Boris Johnson is clearly a chancellor. There's an absolutely brilliant article by Fintan O'Toole in the, in the next edition of the New York Review of Books, which is online at the moment. I mean, you're, you're, uh, Fintan O'Toole is one of your great gifts to journalism and to the study of Britain, actually. Anyone who wants to understand what's really going on in British politics <laughs> has to buy the Irish Times and read Fintan. His article is, I mean, I was tempted just to read out large parts of it to you. It's so good, this one. Um, but you're all capable of reading, so you can see it online. But an absolutely brilliant analysis of, of Boris, which I completely agree with, because I know Boris quite well. He is, he is a chancellor. He doesn't believe in anything apart from Boris Johnson. He certainly doesn't believe in Brexit or not Brexit. I mean, he's the Roman emperor for whom policy is bread and circuses. He can do Brexit. He could do against Brexit. When he came out for Brexit and leading the Leave campaign, it was after he wrote his famous two articles for the Daily Telegraph, one of which is why we should stay. So he'd be perfectly capable of, of despite everything he's said over the last three years, of coming out in favour of, um, of uh, Remain at the end of the day. Uh, all of this is perfectly tradable. All that he wants to do is to survive as Prime Minister because his whole life has been to be, as he put it at the age of eight, to become world king and in our system of government, the closest you can become, unless he's going to launch a coup against Her Majesty, the closest he can become to that is Prime Minister. So once he's there, he'll want to remain. And uh, on any cool calculation, he therefore wouldn't want an election because that would be uh, deeply perilous, but he is also a chancellor, which Finton brings out very strongly, and he might just gamble on an election, so it's possible. But even if there's an election, in my judgment, an election can only result in a referendum, because I cannot conceive how an election could produce a clear majority for a hard Brexit or no deal, which is the only alternative to, uh, to what's on offer at the moment. There isn't a majority for any version of of, uh, of Theresa May's deal, and there's no way that a Conservative Party would just fought an election on, on, on a hard Brexit or no deal could then pass some um, halfway house deal. So I think that the inevitable consequence of an election would be a referendum, so it would just mean that we get the referendum in two stages rather than in one stage. But anyway, that's my view. Uh, it hasn't changed. We can discuss it in questions afterwards, and if you want to understand Boris, then, um, then Fintan O'Toole is... is is, is an absolutely brilliant way of doing so. I just want, though, because I'm speaking in Dublin and I feel so passionately about British-Irish relations and the situation in Northern Ireland, to say a few words about how I see the, uh, the really significant Irish dimension to Brexit, which, of course, has two aspects to it which, which overlap, which is the situation in Northern Ireland and uh, relations between uh, the United Kingdom and uh, the Republic of Ireland. It's always been my view, uh, which again I've repeated ad nauseum long before the backstop was even negotiated, but it sort of, it, it uh, in many ways vindicated it, that Ireland would be the Achilles heel of Brexit because it is not possible to leave the European Union and to maintain relations with either the Republic of Ireland or with uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which are as close as they were before. And anything which tends to pull Ireland and Britain apart and involves harder border arrangements in Northern Ireland is going to be deeply destructive, not only of the relations between states, but crucially the relations between peoples. And we know, because the past has never left us and is still very much alive and well in, uh, in communities uh, in the north, that anything that tends to pull peoples apart is deeply dangerous. And that is the reason why Theresa May, who I think has in many ways handled this whole um, 
uh, episode very, very badly. I mean, in her defence, she didn't create Brexit, she inherited it, but nonetheless, it's been handled very badly. But the one set of decisions she has taken consistently all the way through, and I'd pay tribute to her for it, is that while accepting that Brexit should happen, which I think was a mistaken premise, actually, but she decided to do that and as a Conservative leader, maybe she had no choice. But while doing that, she sought to negotiate an agreement with the European Union and the Republic of Ireland that did not involve new border arrangements, which would be deeply destructive of the Good Friday Agreement and relations with the Republic of Ireland. That's why she agreed to the, uh, the joint report of December 2017, which introduced what's now called the backstop. It's why she, it wasn't forced on her. She willingly negotiated it. She did so under the strong advice of the security services that anything that did involve harder border arrangements between the Republic and Northern Ireland would, um, would certainly lead to disruption, would probably lead to mass smuggling and illegality on that border. And if you have disruption and illegality and the division of peoples, then, of course, you're opening the door to something far, far worse. And I don't need to tell this audience what the far worse could be. But Theresa May accepted that. It's why she agreed the backstop. It's why even when the backstop then became bitterly controversial with the, with the right wing of the Conservative Party, who saw it as basically keeping Northern Ireland within the European Union, which is true. That is basically what it does. That is essentially, I mean, it's always important in politics to simplify to what is the reality of the situation. The reality of the backstop is that whilst Great Britain would leave the European Union, Northern Ireland would stay in, in some very peculiar uh, kind of... Um, uh, you know, Switzerland's type arrangement is essentially what would have would have happened to to uh, Northern Ireland. But even as that became controversial, she did not actually ditch the backstop. What she did was two things. Firstly, she sought to create a UK-wide backstop. She hoped that by generalising it, it would become more acceptable. And in fact, that didn't make it any more acceptable because the, that just heralded the possibility of the whole of the United Kingdom staying in the in the. Um, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the single market and the customs union. Now, I, of course, thought that was wonderful because that is then the obvious thing if you're going to stay in the customs union and the single market and all that is why don't you just stay in the whole thing? I mean, you know, so I was busy pointing out in speeches in the House of Lords that a UK-wide backstop was fantastic because it means that we wouldn't really leave the EU. We could go back in again very rapidly. And you can imagine how well that argument went down with the right wing of the Conservative Party. Um, but even then, when she then faced another revolt from the right against that backstop, what she did, crucially, was not to disown the backstop what she did instead was to seek what she called alternative arrangements. Now, the, this is where it gets positively Orwellian, because the alternative, there aren't any alternative arrangements. The truth is no one in human history has devised uh, a, 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 a set of relations between states that involve different regulatory systems, customs and tariff uh, regimes, and different immigration rules, and don't involve border controls. It's not possible, because either these, or all of these, these elements are, 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 are non-existent, or they have to be policed. So that is the reality of the situation. So there are no alternative arrangements. So what happened was, there being no alternative arrangements, despite the fact that there were some which it was thought might conceivably be possible to be devised at some point in the, uh, in the future, but that not being the case, what she then did, this is where it becomes wonderfully Orwellian, is she set up an alternative arrangements working group. And so I remember asking her myself, Prime Minister, how, what is the work? How are we getting on with the alternative arrangements? Work, uh, with the alternative arrangements? She said, we're making very good progress. We have set up an alternative arrangements working group. Well, the alternative arrangements working group spent three months producing no alternative arrangements at all. Uh, but this uh, deferred the, uh, the issue of what the alternative arrangements might be. And as of now, if I can give you an update on the work of the alternative arrangements working group, the alternative arrangements working group itself has been dismantled. It has, doesn't meet. But people who are trying to make some kind of new Brexit deal viable whilst accepting there should be no hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, have gone off on a kind of freelance operation trying to devise alternative arrangements. And indeed, they yesterday published their final report. It's called the Alternative Arrangements Working Group report by the, I think it's called the UK Prosperity Commission or something. And those of you who really are interested in all this and study it in fine detail, there's an article by Nicky Morgan, who's a senior Conservative MP who uh, I think very much hopes to be a part of the Boris Johnson uh, government in the Evening Standard about... The alternative arrangements, which is headed, it has a wonderful headline. There are alternative arrangements, except what the actual article says, if you read it, is that if we have a three or four year period where we look at the possibility of doing stuff in the cloud electronically and all that, we might be able to devise alternative arrangements. But we need some stable basis default procedure between now and then, which 
she actually says there, might mean a temporary backstop. So, of course, the temporary backstop will be until these alternative arrangements are negotiated. So you come round and round in circles. If you accept the premise that there should be, as a matter of policy, no harder border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, then you have to have something like the backstop. If it's not going to be the backstop, it has to be something that's equivalent. Nobody can work out what's equivalent, so you come back to the backstop. You go round and round in circles, then, which is the reason why... Uh, Ireland has been the Achilles heel of, um, of Brexit all the way through, and I don't believe that that will change because of the perfectly simple reason that the only way of not having a border is not to have a border. There is no other way of not having a border. And the only way of not having a border is not to have differences of immigration, regulatory, and customs and tariff rules on each side. And since the whole purpose of Brexit in the conception of those people who are propagating is precisely that there should be different immigration, tariff, and regulatory rules, you therefore have to have a separate regime for Northern Ireland. It is just not possible to square this circle anyway. And my concluding remark is why is it that I believe there is the Achilles heel? It's because the, the overwhelming majority of parliamentarians in, um, in, uh, in Britain. And I believe actually when it comes to the crunch, this will include Boris Johnson, are not prepared to take responsibility for turning the clock back either in terms of the situation in Northern Ireland or in terms of the fundamental relations between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. And even if in their most irresponsible mo m uh, moods some of the extreme Brexiters like Boris say they are, I do believe when they are face to face with the security advice, with the deteriorating security situation in Northern Ireland, and with um, having to take responsibility for what could be a really serious deterioration in, um, in, in the situation in Ireland, I don't believe that they will actually go there. And so my strong advice to my friends in the Irish government and the Irish diplomatic service, and those of you who uh, who uh, hold the destinies of your great nation in your hands, is the way to deal with Boris Johnson is as follows. To be impeccably polite to him, but to be totally uncompromising. And then we'll get through this crisis together, probably without Brexit. But even if some form of Brexit goes through, it'll then be a very soft Brexit, and the alternative arrangements will last forever. Thank you very much. Getting to wonder there for a while, were you going to write another chapter of Yes Minister? <laughs> that was fascinating. Um, I'm, I invite questions or comments. Uh, if you don't mind, if you'd say who you are and if you're uh, associated with an organisation. Yes. Uh, Brendan Lynch, uh, what's, going to happen, what's going to happen on the 1st of November? Uh, does a mic here if you want? Uh, the sun is going to rise. <laughs> And everything will be the same as on the 31st of October. Because I, don't, there's no, I can't conceive of a situation where Brexit will have happened by, by the 31st of October, so it'll be fine. You know, the default is that Britain leaves the European Union on the 31st of October. So how is it not going to leave? The default is whatever Parliament decides, because we're a parliamentary democracy. And um, uh, I, I, we know the past always being the best guide to the future. When faced with the last default, which was the United Kingdom leaving on the, 30th, on the 29th of March, where the default was also leaving with no deal, faced with the prospect of that happening, and a, a government that was still trying to keep it in play until very late in the day, Parliament took charge. Legislation was passed over the head of Parliament, so over the head of the government, requiring the government to, to, to negotiate a, a, an extension of the negotiating period, and that is precisely what happened. And the majority for that course of action is now larger than now, it, now than it was then, because as of next week, a sizable group of ministers headed by Philip Hammond, our finance minister, who are, who are basically sensible, moderate people, who are, who are absolutely not prepared to tolerate uh, uh, no deal will have left the government, which is the reason why the government was defeated by a majority of 42 yesterday on this crucial issue of proroguing, which is, means trying to govern without Parliament in, in September and October. And it looks to me as if that majority of 42 and the people who either voted with the majority or abstained, which included a lot of ministers led by Philip Hammond, who won't be ministers next week, that majority will assert itself in October. So the default actually if you're thinking about what is the most, the, 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 uh, 
the, the course of action to which Parliament itself will default, uh, the default is a further extension of Article 50. The question is whether this time we can get a further extension of the negotiating period with an actual policy that's viable to resolve the crisis. And that actual policy, in my judgment, the only one that really works is a referendum. I find it, as I've said in an interview with the Irish Times before, because I'm very important, it's very clear this is understood, I find it almost inconceivable, not completely inconceivable, because in life and in politics thing can, things can happen by accident, but it's almost inconceivable that the United Kingdom will leave the European Union on the 31st of October without a comprehensive set of relations which amount to something like the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration as an absolute minimum. Thank you. This gentleman here and then at the back. No, I just want to say. With your permission, Chairman, I'll stay seated because of my back disability. Uh, welcome, Lord Adonis. I don't know if you're can, watching. Can you tell us who you are? John Connor is my name. I come from this um, uh, uh, I don't know, Lord Adonis, if you're watching last night the special panorama programme on, uh, on Brexit. <laughs> And you rightly commented on the, the genius of the British uh, Foreign Service to, you know, for, for coming up with solutions and for compromise and so on. That has been a historical fact. But if you, the interesting thing last night was there were two central figures, Martin Selmayr and, mm. of course, Marshal ba Michel Barnier. Both of them commented consistently on the lack of preparation by the British delegation, whether it was led by Davis or whoever, on all occasions. They just didn't have anything prepared even that could fool the Europeans. Uh, can you explain what was going on? Why, why did the Foreign Service, I know it wasn't directly uh, because there was a special Brexit, Brexit department set up, but why these wonderful civil servants somehow hadn't uh, hatched a plan of some kind? And very often, as you know, I was once a member of the Parliament okay. myself, civil servants are more important than ministers. Um, well, it's not because we don't have very able people. Uh, Ollie Robbins, who was the chief negotiator for Theresa May, is one of the most able officials that I, as a former minister, have ever worked with. But the problem is, if you have a, a hopeless and impossible policy, then no amount of ability can disguise the fact that the policy is hopeless and impossible. And once Theresa May had made her speech in Lancaster House in January 2017, setting out as her red lines her non-negotiable um, requirements that Britain should leave the customs union, leave the single market, and leave all of the collective institutions which are within the wider ambit of the European Union, including things like Euratom and, and the, Euro the European Medi Medicines Agency and things of this kind, then it, there was no amount of ingenuity that could negotiate around that. That was the problem. So actually, it's not the case that, the, uh, that Ollie Robbins was unprepared in the sense of not having done one huge amount of homework and lots of drafting. They'd done all of the homework work and lots of drafting, but you cannot draft your way around the fact that you're leaving the customs union and the single market and you're not going to be part of Euratom. And the, and the problem all the time is, is that because these were basically impossible propositions to wed to a deep and special partnership and a continuing strong economic relationship, it, they were between a rock and a hard place. And um, the only way, it's true that some of the ministers were very unprepared. Well, in my experience, by the way, ministers are often unprepared. The officials were prepared, but the ministers were unprepared. But part of the reason why the ministers had to be unprepared, it's the reason why Boris Johnson sounds extremely unprepared at the moment, is it's not possible to prepare those positions and, and for them to be sustainable. It, once you declare as your position that you both want to have close trading relations with the European Union and the capacity to negotiate third-party trading agreements with the rest of the world, and you want to leave the customs union and the single market and diverge in key regulatory and customs arrangements terms from them, you cannot put these propositions together. The only way you can actually get through a meeting and utter them is by not being prepared and simply declaring them. Because you, can't, you, cannot, you cannot do in the way of an essay or any form of preparation extend the propositions with any further detail. Because as soon as you seek to do so, it unravels. So Liam Fox, who's quite a bright guy, he's a GP and all of that, who was talking about global Britain and how we're going to negotiate the, the, uh, the additional trade deals and all of that, he never could get to the position of explaining how he would do it. Because, of course, as soon as you start to explain it, you come up against the facts that the European Union has... 53 trade agreements with 73 other nations, which are most of those with which he would then want to start negotiating trade agreements from a cold start. 
completely exploding his own proposition. So this has been the fundamental difficulty all the way through. It's not that it's a lack of preparation, but if you are proposing to drive yourself off the edge of a cliff, it doesn't really matter whether you have a, a detailed or a vague map you still end up over the edge of the cliff. This is the difficulty, and this is the situation which they faced. And it's the reason why Ollie Robbins is not going to continue as the Prime Minister's negotiator. He's announced it. He's leaving the civil service. Why? It's just impossible for him to continue doing his job, given that the red lines are becoming even harder than they were before, and he, he could barely get an agreement on the basis of the last ones. So the preparation will be even less, not because there aren't very bright people involved, but because no amount of, of intelligence and ingenuity can turn a cliff edge into a golden meadow. Thank you. Um, I've, I've two hands down at the back, and I've four at the front. I, can't, I won't take any more for the moment. At the very back there. Yes. Thank you, um, Michael McLaughlin, a member of the Institute as well. There's another scenario during the rounds, I don't know if you could evaluate it, which is that I suppose Boris Johnson and the modern Tory party, been quite English nationalist, could revert to a Northern Ireland only backstop. And, and sacrifice the DUP, uh, because then you would, if you could secure such a deal through Parliament, then through an alternative majority, you'd go straight for a general election and you wouldn't need the DUP anymore. Uh, so it would be the withdrawal agreement with a Northern Ireland only backstop. Uh, well, I, it, 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 it can't be done, is the point, because it certainly can't be done in this Parliament, because of course if it, it reverts to a Northern Ireland only backstop, the DUP will definitely vote against him. And if the DUP definitely vote against him, then there are the Conservative Party without the DUP is a minority in the House of Commons. And in that minority will be 15 to 20 Conservatives led by Dominic Grieve, who I think was speaking here last Friday, and so you'll have heard what he said. Dominic Grieve is not voting for any form of the current withdrawal agreement or political declaration unless there's a referendum which endorses it. And that, that, that is one group of Conservative MPs. And there will be a group of ERG MPs. Have any of you met Sir William Cash and Mark Francois and these people? Let me just tell you, you should invite him to speak. And I can assure you that you will hear from him that there is no version of, of, of Theresa May's withdrawal agreement, with it, whether it's a Northern Ireland backstop, whether it's a backstop that just extends to the, the town of Coleraine. There is none that, that Bill Cash is voting for. So there, there simply aren't the votes for that proposition, even if, because that one is negotiable, obviously, because it started off as a Northern Ireland backstop and, and then it became a UK backstop. And there, there are no votes for it. The only way it could conceivably go through is if um, there were a general election and a big Conservative majority, big enough to outvote the moderates in the Conservative Party and, of course, entirely independent of the, of the, the DUP. And uh, I think, as you know, pigs flying is a much more likely scenario than, than that. Uh, Ronan Tynan, a filmmaker and member of the Institute. Actually, I was based in London during the referendum campaign, and I was a very passionate campaigner for Remain. And uh, it's really wonderful to hear someone in your position being optimistic about the prospect of uh, one, a referendum, and that refer referendum voting Remain the next time. But one thing I want to put at you, because uh, most people in this room would be quite experienced in handling EU referenda. And one of the most significant features about these referendum campaigns in Ireland that were very successful, generally speaking, in securing support for Europe was the active involvement of trade unions and businesses, you know, the key drivers of the economy. And one thing that shocked me in Britain was the lack of action, the lack of activity, the lack of involvement by these key players representing workers and employers, blah, blah. And, you know, it is conceivable that a referendum could be passed, but the way business and even trade unions are intimidated off the political mm. field, even listening to somebody like Len McCluskey, who only finally, the leader of Unite, came out mm. when the prospect mm. of a no deal Brexit yeah. is on that. And he admitted as well, he said, you know, I listen to my members and in all my various committees, no one is voting for me. So I put it to you, how, how is it conceivable that Remain could be passed the next time, which I passionately hope that it is, if the main drivers, the main people who really okay. are responsible in practical terms of the economy remain virtually neutral or unengaged. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Well, we definitely need them engaged if there's get to be a second referendum. And um, I believe they will be much more engaged than, uh, than, than last time, is the answer to that because they realised that the stakes are so much higher. The thing to understand about last time is that almost everybody thought that Remain was going to win, so they didn't need to exert themselves, and uh, that won't be the case uh, next time. So far as the trade union movement was concerned, there was a, a further factor last time, which is that it was, was, of course, a referendum 
called by David Cameron and George Osborne, and these aren't the most trade union friendly figures, who, particularly when you're dealing with people like uh, Len McCluskey. So they sat it out last time, and that won't be the case next time. But, um, uh, and I think, by the way, we have a lot to learn from Ireland in the conduct of referendums, a lot, in terms of how you mobilise uh, opinion, uh, third party uh, engagement, uh, grand conversations, and um, and uh, 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 convention type arrangements, and, uh, and uh, I hope we'll make use of uh, of all of that in uh, in a referendum. That's all important. But the fundamental reason why I believe we'd win a second referendum and didn't win the first referendum is in a second referendum on this Europe issue, uh, the turnout amongst young people is going to go sky high, and the young are going to mobilise the young. Uh, under 30s are energised by Brexit in a way I have never seen them engaged uh, in politics in the past. There's a whole set of youth groups, including in Northern Ireland, a wonderful group called Our Future, Our Choice, Northern Ireland, which has some across community group that is, is really um, uh, uh, making uh, significant inroads in the debate in, uh, in Northern Ireland. That's, this is going to be a big, big factor in the referendum, and the overwhelming majority of young people are going to vote uh, remain in that referendum. And uh, I do... I, spent the last year doing meetings up and down the country, but I do a lot of youth meetings and university meetings, and it's the first time I've done in my political career large meetings of young people, and as one of the students put it to me, the meeting I did recently when I explained, you know, exactly how, what's at stake, that they're going to lose the right to, uh, you know, live, travel, work, love, do all the, you know, across Europe, across uh, the 28 nations they've got at the moment. One said to me, yeah, I think we now get it. He said, what you're really saying is that we're going to be shut up on a small island with Jacob rees Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's not a good idea. <laughs> and that is what is going to win the second referendum uh, for us. It's going to be the young mobilising the young. And, uh, you know, a, 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 nobody born in this millennium voted in the last referendum, which is not lost on uh, the, the young people of, uh, of the UK today, and that is not going to be the case, of course, in a, in a second referendum. Interesting. The, the, the young were very important in recent referendums here. Don, Donald Denham, thank you, uh, Lord Adonis. I share your interest in trains, but what you've been describing is, in fact, a train wreck. Um, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned what I would consider, many would consider, the highest probability, therefore your highest improbability, and that is uh, a, a general election, a Tory part, party that is obliterated or badly split, and a Labour premiership under Jeremy Corbyn. And indeed, why not Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, uh, well, of course, I'm wildly enthusiastic about that, that option. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's possible, it's possible. Um, but I think actually the very fact that it is possible is the reason why Boris won't call an election. That he's there with Linton Crosby, who is a past master at, at, uh, at uh, winning elections, and you, when you do the numbers. You see, the first thing that's going to happen after Boris Johnson becomes Prime Minister is a by-election in a place called Brecon and Radnor, which is a part of rural Wales on the English border, uh, which the Lib Dems are almost certain to win by a landslide which is hugely significant because the Lib Dems, when they were in coalition with the Conservatives, were eviscerated in the 2015 election and barely recovered in the 2017 election. But they have, partly because of Brexit and partly because they are the only viable non-Conservative party in most of provincial England, they've uh, been surging uh, recently. So when you, as soon as you start looking at that, plus the fact that the Conservative Party would be wiped out by the SNP in, um, in Scotland if there was an early election, plus the fact that the Peterborough by-election, which is very recently last month, in a Labour Conservative marginal, which is a mainstream part of metropolitan England, Labour, despite the controversy around Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, Labour won that with a big, with a big um, squeeze on the Lib Dem vote because of the tactical position between Labour and the Conservatives. For all those reasons, I don't think there will be an election. But you are right, if there were to be an election, all those considerations could easily lead to a, a Labour government. And for the purposes of Brexit, if there's a Labour government, uh, it, the, what, the first thing that would happen under a Labour government of Brexit is, to, is that Brexit would, to, would be junked. Uh, almost certainly through a referendum, but through a referendum where the government itself was urging a, um, a Remain vote. And if there was a, an election which had returned 
either a majority or a minority Labour government, which itself called a referendum on the cause of Remain immediately after that election, which is what I think would happen, I think that absolutely guarantees that, uh, that Brexit would, uh, would, would be finished. Uh, thank you very much for the, your presentation, Colin Rafter, Retired Foreign Affairs. Two small points. Looking at the idea of a referendum, if there's a move towards a referendum to reverse Brexit, the cry will go up with betrayal, and that would be quite strong, and the Brexit Party would play on that. I'd like you to address that if you could. Secondly, just taking up the point about the British Labour Party, it's a kind of chaos, and we don't really understand what's happening at the side of the, of the, of the, of the channel, the whole question of anti-Semitism and all the rest of it. Does it have a coherent position on, on Brexit? Will it have a coherent position on Brexit? Thank you. Well, I, I was rather hoping you could explain to me what's going on in the Labour Party. <laughs> um, uh, but on Brexit, I mean, there are a lot of other issues inside the Labour Party at the moment, and some of which are, are truly extraordinary, anti-Semitism and all that. But so far as Brexit's concerned, the situation is very simple in the Labour Party. The overwhelming majority of Labour M members of Parliament are Remain and for a second referendum. The overwhelming majority of Labour Party members are for Remain and a second referendum. The majority of Labour voters, it's crucial to understand this because somehow there's a, 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 it's painted as if somehow the north of England is a, a massive working class revolt against, uh, against Europe and um, pressure on the Labour Party. The majority of the Labour vote everywhere across the UK was uh, in favour of Remain, including in the north of England. The reason why our position has been nuanced, if I can put it that way, is because Jeremy Corbyn himself is historically a Brexiter. It's very important to understand this. It's not a, ma it's not a secret issue. He voted against, he was, uh, was anti-common market in the 70s. He voted against all the European um, uh, treaties, right up to and including the Lisbon Treaty. And he's been on a journey. And he has sort of reluctantly come to a position where, partly because of the objective situation of Brexit and the Brexit deal that's clearly the um, uh, Thatcherism by other means, but also because of the need to lead a party which is, uh, as, which is united. He's come painfully to, to, a, to a Remain position. And he, but he has come to that position. You know, his statement of policy last week is that Labour would both call a referendum in any scenario, whether there's a Conservative or a Labour government, and we would campaign for Remain in any scenario except one where Labour had itself negotiated a great Brexit deal. That ain't happening as everybody, uh, besides probably two members of his staff, that no, that's not happening. So Labour's position is, is actually on the, on the Brexit issue is, uh, is, is clear. It's, it's been a painful process, but it's been a painful process for the same reason why Jeremy Corbyn's whole leadership of the Labour Party has been painful, because there are very big differences between uh, somebody who's, uh, uh, who, who holds Jeremy's views and mainstream social democrats. Well, there, there clearly will be a cry of betrayal, and Nigel Farage, who is the an extremely um, uh, an extremely capable uh, populist, will get it going in a big way. But it's very important to, to distinguish between the cries of betrayal from the populist right, which is where Nigel Farage and part of the Conservative Party come from, and the actual sentiment on the ground. It is not the case, as you might think from reading the newspapers or some of the media reports, that England is a seething cauldron of, of, of internecine strife on the issue of Europe. Most people, Europe is way, way down their list of priorities. And indeed, the only seriously organised popular movement in respect of Europe, as opposed to wider populist issues in respect of Europe, has been on the Remain side. The only big demonstrations there have been in England throughout this whole Brexit experience have been the big Remain demonstrations in London, which there have been three now of over a million. There have never been any on the Leave side, which are large. The reason, of course, why we had the 52% leave in the referendum is because the people were required to vote in a referendum, which they never showed any sign of wanting. It was an internal Conservative Party fix by David Cameron, which called the referendum. So my judgment, and I can only offer you my judgment, is that in the event of a second referendum voting to remain in the EU, whether it's by large majorities, I would expect, or even by a small majority, is that that would resolve the issue. It's not that it isn't going to have a, a long, a, a, a vocal minority that will argue against it, that will probably continue to be the case because there is a, a vocal minority that are against British membership of the um, EU. But that is not a passionately held view by a, by a sizable uh, part of the electorate. And uh, they will 
in a second referendum as in a first referendum votes because they're required to do so. But the, the, uh, the issues that really mobilise public sentiment at large in the areas that voted leave are not to do with Europe. They're to do with austerity, they're to do with the state of the public services, they're to do with job opportunities and educational opportunities for young people, they're to do with housing, they're to do with a whole lot of bread and butter issues. And the only overlap between those bread and butter issues and Brexit, which is a genuine policy issue, is immigration, which was definitely a factor three years ago. But the immigration issue has gone far down the list of priorities in the last three years as immigration from the EU has, has significantly reduced. There's now net migration from the from Britain to the EU at the moment, and the composition of the immigration coming into Britain is now heavily uh, in favour of immigrants coming from outside the EU and not inside the EU. So the, the, the immigration issue, which was definitely a big issue because of our decision to admit, Central and East, to admit immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe after 2004 without the transitional controls, which the rest of, of uh, the EU put in place, that, is, that, that uh, issue uh, has now been diminishing in importance and and um, therefore, as a, a popular um, uh, cause, uh, Brexit has is, is been diminishing rapidly. Kieran O'Mara, member of the Institute. Considering that there is a need for unanimity to extend uh, Article 50, um, required of the Council of Ministers or the European Council in October, can you be sure that all the member states will agree to extend Article 50 uh, a further period? Well, of course I can't be sure, but again in March what happened was uh, that, that, uh, uh, that your Taoiseach and uh, Chancellor Merkel were leading the, um, uh, the calls for, uh, uh, and Donald Tusk, the President of the European Council, were leading the, uh, the, the, um, the cause of a long extension, and um, uh, the opposite cause was led by President Macron, but he was not calling for no extension, he was calling for a short one in order to concentrate minds. And uh, that looks to me to be probably a good opening description of what would happen next time too. But it's very clear if you look at the positions taken by Chancellor Merkel, the, uh, the, uh, the, pres the, the presidency of the European Council and your Taoiseach, that none of them want to take responsibility for Brexit and as soon as they decline to agree an extension, they're taking responsibility for Brexit. It radically changes the situation, because at that point, the reason why Brexit happens is because of the EU. It's not because of Britain. And what Donald Tusk, who's been a very wise president of the Council, and Chancellor Merkel has been an absolutely brilliant Chancellor of Germany, worked out long ago, is that if Britain leaves the European Union, which will be a colossal mistake and deeply damaging both for Britain and for the EU, it must be Britain that takes responsibility for it, and not a stab-in-the-back argument that will develop about how they were forced out by the EU. And Merkel realised a long time ago, because she exhibits massive patience, it's, of course it's easier to be patient if you've been Chancellor of your head of your government for 15 years, so you, you've seen all these things in the, uh, in, in the, uh, at, uh, in, in the longer process. Um, she understood a long time ago that the way to deal with Brexit, so far as the EU is concerned, is patience and not attempting to force the pace. And it looks to me pretty clear that that's the strategy that she'll adopt in October, so far as your, as, as your government's concerned, of course, for Ireland, if anything, Ireland has even less interest in a hard or disorganised Brexit than the United Kingdom, because you not only get all the trade problems and the dislocation, economic dislocation issues, but of course you get the full brunt of the whatever is going to happen on the border. And therefore, as I've been patiently explaining to um, to journalists in, 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 in London who don't sufficiently understand this, it's not the case that you have a United Kingdom position where we want an extension and this angry and, uh, and um, uh, fed up EU that's uh, not prepared to grant it. Actually, so far as the key players in the EU are concerned, they worked out a long time ago that they have just as little interest in a hard or disorderly or no deal Brexit as we have. And in the case of Ireland, they have an even greater interest in it not happening. And all they have to do to avoid it is to extend. They don't have to do anything else. And so I'm fairly confident that that would happen in October. It would be helpful if, we, if, if, if there was actually a policy of what was going to happen in the extension. But even if there isn't a policy of what should happen in the extension, it's still self-evidently in the interest of the EU itself to extend. That I, I would be very surprised if that doesn't, doesn't result. 
Thanks. Um, welcome back to uh, Dublin Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm John McGrain. I'm from the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. Um, just sticking with that point for a moment. Um, so you've you painted a picture that ultimately, I think, leads towards a, re a second <coughs> referendum. Um, the first thing that will happen to Boris about seven minutes after he's elected, before the Brecon by-election, is Whitehall officials will lock him in a room and say, this is the truth, nothing will work. And so he's faced with the stark reality of having got power, but being expected to exert it uh, appropriately. Um, if you map that forward, and bearing in mind that we're still almost three months away, or actually three months away from the denouement of this, no matter how late it runs, so there's time, wh what will be the step by which he, as PM, knowing that harsh reality, is the owner of ultimately a policy shift towards a second referendum? Because that seems completely at odds with what we're hearing right now. A, a long holiday is my answer to your question. The first thing that happens when Boris becomes Prime Minister next Thursday, everyone goes on holiday. Uh, and he can't negotiate with the EU because there's no one to negotiate with. I can assure you, Monsieur Barnier is not proposing to spend his summer in, uh, in Brussels doing a negotiation. So the first thing that happens is everyone goes on holiday. Um, uh, there, there may be some courtesy calls. Maybe the, the, the Taoiseach and Boris Johnson will meet. Maybe Chancellor Merkel will meet. But these will be essentially at the courtesy level. They're not going to be serious negotiations. So nothing seriously in terms of negotiations would start until September. Uh, the great beauty of diplomats, even when they uh, uh, have impossible positions to negotiate, is that you can at least keep it going for some period of time. And so I would, uh, and it's particularly important for Boris that, that negotiations of some kind, even if they're not leading anywhere at all, uh, continue uh, during and beyond the Conservative Party conference, because he has a slight problem. He has to deliver his rabble-rousing speech to the Conservative conference about how he's about to triumph over everyone at the end of September. So what happens, I think, is everyone goes on holiday for five or six weeks. Negotiations start in September. He turns up at the Conservative Party conference and the meeting of Parliament in September and says, I can't say anything at all. I've got to be unaccustomedly quiet. I've zipped my, my mouth up, which is something Boris almost never does, because we are having these, these really important and detailed negotiations, and uh, they're going extremely well. Uh, and then that takes us to October, and then we get pitched into the crisis then. And by then, he hopes... Well, of course, by then, that is two months since... Uh, he's, he started, essentially. And since he's perfectly capable of eating his words at two minutes' notice, he doesn't need two months, by then he, he will be perfectly able to take a different position. But even if he doesn't, as I say, all, everything I described earlier about what will happen in Parliament will, will then start in, in October anyway, I think. Uh, Cormac McQuinn from the Irish Independent. Uh, you said earlier that your advice for the Irish government in terms of dealing with Boris Johnson is to be impeccably polite and uh, uncompromising. For, take the scenario where the Irish government is uncompromising. What's stopping Boris Johnson then following through on the, the promises he's made during the leadership campaign just to leave on the on October 31st with no deal? Why, why wouldn't he do that? Pa Parliament. No there's, a, there's a fundamental obstacle to him doing so. Parliament has to agree and Parliament won't agree. It's, it's fundamental. Uh, Parliament voted by, the House of Commons voted by 430 to, votes to 203 from memory against no deal last time it came up. Uh, the only mechanism by which he could overcome that is by banning Parliament from meeting, which is this thing called prorogation, which is something which hasn't been attempted since the English Civil War for a, 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 a protracted period of political controversy. But Parliament yesterday voted, the House of Commons voted by a majority of 42, essentially to require Parliament to meet in September and October. It did it with huge ingenuity because people are being extremely ingenious at using the full resources of the British Constitution at the moment. It did it actually, ironically, on the back of a bill to extend the powers of the government to continue uh, quasi-direct rule in Northern Ireland, because there isn't an assembly in the executive. And the Speaker of the House of Commons, who is part of this great ingenuity, allowed a whole set of amendments to be moved to that bill, which uh, have fundamentally amend the British Constitution. I mean, have nothing whatever to do with the operation of the executive and the, uh, and the assembly of Northern Ireland. And it's that that requires, and it does it, it's, I mean, it's, it's wonderfully ingenious. You know, these the officials, when they get going, including parliamentary officials and Dominic Grieve, who's great at this, and me and others, we can do very well. So the way it's being done, you'll find hilarious. In order to use this piece of Northern Ireland legislation to, to stop prorogation in September and October, amendments have been moved, which have now been agreed by the majority of 42 yesterday, that require govern the government 
to publish a report every week during the autumn on the progress towards establishing the executive and the assembly in Northern Ireland, and for those reports to be debated by Parliament, which requires Parliament, therefore, to meet. So there are going to be one long succession of debates on the Assembly and Executive in Northern Ireland in the autumn, which is as it should be, because it is an extraordinary situation that we're now two and a half years since there was an Assembly and Executive in Northern Ireland. I mean, that alone would justify this meeting and what on earth is going on in the government of Northern Ireland at the moment, which is a terrible, terrible situation. But of course, when all those reports come and Parliament is meeting, that will give ample opportunity for the next set of proposals to come forward, which will rule out no deal, require the government to negotiate an extended negotiating period, and I I think probably by the time we get to October, if not an actual referendum, a process that, that would lead to a referendum. So it's not within Boris Johnson's gift, whatever he says, to actually deliver no deal unless he can command a parliamentary majority and he's not within sight of a parliamentary majority for, uh, for no deal. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Musiswe and I am the member of the institution, of the institute. Uh, on, on the is, uh, issue of uh, Boris Johnson, you said he's a chancer. He doesn't believe in anything apart from Boris. Wouldn't you say the same about the British, that they are chancers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't mean it to be a joke. <laughs> um, but the point is that um, there are chances in a sense that they overestimated their value. Uh, for example, uh, Britain, as we all know, they went all around the world. And in my opinion, they never learned anything apart from being British. And now this is a big problem because they still think they are very important people. Of course, you are very important people, but to a certain degree. And now what is bothering me is that you, uh, you hear conversations of saying there is a wide, big, a great world waiting for us. But no one is reminding you guys that how about all these offenses we have caused uh, are, they, are they going to be waiting for us with open arms? Because, as I said, you never learned anything apart from being British. So, how are you going? And no one is addressing that issue. And that is the problem where everyone seems to be polishing egos instead of let's, let's speak honestly and truthfully. Because this is where at least you'll get to look inside yourselves instead of continuous this big, massive Britishness. You're still important, by the way, but not that important in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, wow. Um, uh, that was a great question. All I can answer is that there isn't one Britain. My father came to Britain in uh, 60 years ago from Cyprus. And the reason he came to Britain was that he was part of a movement which was fighting a uh, a war of independence against Cyprus, uh, which was very bloody, I mean, extremely bloody. Villages it, that were, were interned, people were executed, including his, many of his friends. It was a terrible situation. But when they were seeking to get out of the country, which was disintegrating at the time, where did they come? Because they had British passports. They came to London. One of the largest communities in Britain is, of, of, is the Irish community. Uh, most of them are only too well aware of the excesses of Britain internationally within these isles. They come with no illusions too, but they're equal members of, um, of Britain too. And the truth is, I think there's more than one Britain. There is a Britain which is well, well aware of, uh, of um, the excesses which have been committed by the imperialist generations and those of an imperialist mindset. There are those that appear to be intent on repeating the mistakes. Uh, this is a, a, a big struggle for the soul of, it's particularly a struggle for the soul of England at the moment that's taking place. Because of course the Scots, the Welsh uh, have, have themselves been 
had huge experience over the, the centuries of, uh, of, uh, of difficult relations with uh, a, a very dominant, dominant England. And this Brexit issue is the playing out in part of that big debate in England. And people like me are absolutely determined that we should learn the lessons of the past, including, crucially, crucially, less the lessons of the past in terms of Britain's relations with Ireland. Because there is no greater horror and disaster story than the relations within these islands between the country which is the nation which is roughly called England today and the nation which is roughly called Ireland. It's been a, a terrible situation. And uh, that is a significant part of this debate. So I'm not in any way excusing the imperialist mindset which animates part of the English elite today or the mistakes and crimes that it's committed in the past. I don't in any way excuse those. All I would say is that that doesn't, isn't the whole of England. I don't even believe it's the settled will of the majority in England. And this Brexit... Um, um, issue that we're playing out is, is, is the latest manifestation of that. Uh, I'm extremely um, uh, depressed and downheartened. I mean, I've, I've tried to exude optimism uh, in, uh, in my remarks, and I am about the ultimate uh, uh, outcome of this, but I'm very de depressed at, at, at how uh, strongly entrenched some of those old attitudes are still within the elite in England. And uh, it's been, um, it's been a, a, a very salutary experience. But the lesson I draw from it is that those of us who hold contrary opinions need to fight even harder for them and uh, shouldn't take for granted that, uh, that progress means uh, being more open-minded, more liberal, and less imperialist. And uh, the dimension, the reason I'm here today is the dimension of this that worries me more than anything else is what could happen in terms of relations between Britain and Ireland and within Ireland itself. The best thing that's happened in the United Kingdom in terms of policy in the last 30 years was the Good Friday Agreement and peace in, in, in Northern Ireland, which also means peace within these isles too. When I was um, 10, I was in Regent's Park when uh, a bomb went off on the bandstand and on a Sunday afternoon and 10 Royal Green Jackets were killed and 30 or 40 were maimed. And when I was growing up in London, uh, my parents wouldn't allow me to go into the West End because of our IRA bombs. There's a generation of us who know only too well what happens when we fail to, uh, to bring about and sustain peace in Northern Ireland. We're determined that this shouldn't happen again, and that is a large part of what's at stake in, in this big Brexit debate. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go over time a little bit because, frankly, I think people are very interested. And I'll take two more questions. There's one there, and there's Bill Emmett here in front. Thank you. Uh, William Scotty, member of the Institute. I'd just like to probe uh, somewhat the whole issue of referendum questions and by what parliamentary, governmental, or commission process, uh, the referendum question or questions would be uh, established. Because you can take it right, if you want to remain, you just revoke Article 50. A remain vote is the equivalent of revoking Article 50, which European law will, uh, will uh, tolerate. Then you have an extant deal uh, that's there. And then you have a, uh, a, what people call a no-deal scenario, which still means there have to be discussions about arrangements and so on. So you, you have a number of different options in a referendum context. And now you, you, you I presume that it wouldn't be practical or wise to have multiple questions. And if you had, say, three options and you got 34, 33, 33, where were you? And I, I, I know that this might depend on the context. For example, you could say it might be reasonable to have remain or revoke versus a deal. But then, presumably in the state of current British opinion, uh, that the people who are so-called no-dealers would uh, really uh, you know, feel totally excluded. So it, it's just if we could explore a little bit the nature of that, uh, of that issue. 
Well, it's, it's clearly a very tricky issue. The mechanism by which it would be decided, though, is very clear. Parliament will decide what the question is. So uh, the issue is what is, would Parliament be likely to um, put as options on the ballot paper? Well, one thing we're certain it would put as an option is remain, because there wouldn't be a referendum unless there was a majority that wanted uh, um, the electorate to have a, an option to remain. So the question is precisely the one that you mentioned, which is what are the non-remain option or options? And there are only two credible spaces where there could be options. One is something around the Theresa May deal being agreed with the European Union, with whatever changes might be agreed in the, in the next two months, if there are to be any changes to the political declaration or something like that. So that's one. And the other is something around what is euphemistically described as no deal. But the problem with no deal is that no deal itself doesn't actually exist, because there isn't literally no deal with planes not flying, the, um, the transport system's not working, six weeks of medical supplies and all that. Even the people who say they're in favour of no deal actually say they want a deal that deals with all those things. So the, the issue is whether there are two or three options. If there are, are three, how you describe the third option being the one that has got the shorthand no deal, and um, then what the voting system is. And uh, I think the truth of the, the, the reality of the situation is that if we get to a referendum, basically the Conservative Party will decide whether it wants one or two options, as well as remain. They'll have to decide that amongst themselves. And they'll also have to decide how to describe it. People like me will complain bitterly about something called no deal that isn't fully described, because I will argue, uh, because it will be true, that this is substantially a unicorn, because no deal or WTO Brexit, whatever it's described as, is a, is a unicorn. It, it doesn't exist. I mean, it's, it can't in its own terms be done. It would require a substantial negotiation, which would mean anything but no deal. It would just mean a different sort of very complex deal. But probably we would lose that argument because Boris probably will want some hard stroke no deal Brexit on the ballot. I would have thought it's almost certain if there are three options that you'd have preferential voting. I, I, almost certain, because if you had first passed the post with three, then obviously this would be loaded in the Remain side I, I, uh, immediately. Uh, now, this again isn't unprecedented. The Swiss often have three option referendums where they have, um, where they have preferential voting. What do I think would happen in that situation? I think Remain would win by a comfortable majority, because what would happen is the people who vote for the halfway house... Uh, which is going to be a minority of those who want to leave, because we will have Farage and most Conservatives will be arguing for the harder option, uh, they will transfer, I would have thought, at least half in favour of Remain as their second option. So we end up with Remain. But how you actually describe those two options, as I say, is would be basically a matter for the Conservative MPs to decide collectively, and it's, n it's not straightforward by any means. Uh, thank you. I, uh, Andrew, I very much, uh, Bill Emmett, sorry, I'm a proud Brexile and former journalist like Lord Adonis, but not in politics. Um, my question, I agree entirely with uh, your analysis and your optimism, but let me ask a slightly pessimistic question about a potential for a soft Brexit from a Boris Johnson government, which is to ask you to do the impossible, perhaps, which is to look into the minds of Jacob Rees-Mogg, Marc Francois and the DUP and Bill Cash and measure their intransigence because it would seem to me that a soft Brexit Boris Johnson option is essentially to, to march them to the brink of a second referendum and say, if you don't agree to get us over this line, we're going to have either a general election which we're wiped out or a second referendum in which you lose your life's hope. Uh, vote for this and then we can argue about the details later, which was always the logical hard Brexit position, but they've never accepted it, perhaps because Theresa May was in charge but now they've got a supposedly believer in charge. What do, you, uh, do you think that that can work, and how intransigent are they? Well, I, I think that there, there are enough of them who are so intransigent that it won't happen. When the Theresa May's deal came to the third vote, when the majority against came down to 60, which is still huge, you know, when Gladstone's proposals for home rule in Ireland were rejected by Parliament, which was probably the single biggest defeat of a government proposition before Brexit, they were rejected in the House of Commons by a majority of 33 in 1886. 33, and that put the kibosh on 
I mean, on, on the whole, uh, the plan. Well, the third iteration of her deal was rejected in the House of Commons as a majority. I think it was a 58. And if you look at the composition of the votes against her, there were um, two groups that I don't think are going to be reconciled. The DUP will never vote for Brexit with, with, with a backstop in because it's existential for them. It will result in... in uh, a, 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 a much worse situation for them in Northern Ireland, which could get much, much worse quite quickly. I mean, you could have a border poll and all kinds of things happening, which would be existential for the DUP. So they're definitely not voting for it. And when you come to this ERG group, a substantial part of them did vote for Theresa May's deal last time, including Jacob Rees-Mogg himself and, um, and Boris Johnson, a group of them. But they're an, an intransigent group. And it's important to understand the motivation for the Bill Cashes, the Marc Francoise and all that. What matters to them actually isn't getting some kind of Brexit over the deal. What matters to them much, much more is, is purity in, as, as Brexiters, because that is what they see as their place in history. Bill Cash does not see his place in history as getting some form of halfway house Brexit over the line. On the contrary, he has spent 40, 30, 40 years now making a whole political niche and, and, and an increasingly... Um, a uh, large one around being completely uh, intransigent on the issue of, um, of membership of the European Union and, and any, an, any close engagement with it. He is not going to change his mind. Mark Francois, I was telling some of the colleagues over lunch before, Mark Francois, when I was doing a debate with him, I've had the misfortune to have to debate with most of these people, so I get to know their way of thinking and their argument quite well. Mark Francois said to me that if Juncker, as he put it, because this is how he describes the President of the European Commission, if Juncker offered to give him £39 billion, he still wouldn't vote for the deal. And I said to him, Mark, can I let you into a secret? If, Jung if Juncker proposes to give me £39 billion, I'm thinking about it extremely seriously. Well, he doesn't like... Uh, none, none of these people, by the way, do humour. So he didn't, he, did, he didn't like that. So he said, I tell you, he said, and if he put a loaded revolver in my mouth, I'm still not voting for it. I said, Mark, if John Claude Juncker puts a loaded revolver in my mouth and says you've got to vote for this deal, I am voting for it immediately without a second thought. But he's not, and there's a whole group of them who definitely aren't. And Farage is definitely not either, because his whole positioning depends upon the stab in the back, not having had anything to do with it, because his whole viability as a populist politician afterwards depend, depends upon not having taken any responsibility for this. So my judgment is that though Boris could in that scenario get the majority down a bit, because he might peel off some of the ERG people, he has an intransigent 10, 15, 20 of the ERG plus the DUP who will simply not vote for it. The only way he could overcome that is by an election where he has a majority independent of them. And as we were saying in discussions of election possibilities, that is a fantasy. So what we're left with, again, is the very, very wise Sherlock Holmes. Once you've eliminated the impossible, you are just left with the improbable, which must be the truth. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I think you have left us with a little optimism. I hope so. That's so why I came. So. Here's to the referendum. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.